Hey there, everyone. Another distribution day with the NASDAQ down 1.8%. The VIX pushing higher, threatening 17. Mega cap growth stocks struggling again with Amazon gapping below its 50-day moving average. Mish Schneider of Market Gauge is going to be joining us from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Will Granny Retail save the day? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hey everyone, welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the action in the markets using the best practices of technical analysis. The technical toolkit is really designed to help you make sense of markets in any environment, partic particularly in uncertain times. This is one of those cloudy periods, right? Uh, Fed Chair Powell, not this uh, most recent press conference, I think it was the Jackson Hole press conference, he described their role of the, uh, the Fed, uh, the governors, uh, of basically navigating by the stars on a cloudy day or a cloudy night. That is exactly the sensation that you get when you try to get a reading on the different market conditions, particularly economic data and employment and all these other readings on inflation. At the end of the day, we are left with the markets themselves, right? What can we learn by analyzing price and trend and momentum, measures of breadth and measures of sentiment, which help us recognize shifts and anticipate extremes in uh, sentiment, euphoria and desperation and all those sentiment uh, psychological levels in between. We'll do our best to recap what happened in the market today. Quite a bit of a distribution today. The NASDAQ, the S&P going lower. As we're getting ready for the show, I kept updating the, uh, the, the uh, percent change in the NASDAQ, kept adding uh, numbers to what we had seen on the, uh, on the red uh, negative return today. Let's get to our market recap, see how things actually played out, how today's move fits into the big picture. Before we get there, though, we asked you a recent poll question. If you could own only one stock in your portfolio for the next three months, what would it be and why? Now, this is, I will be clear, a tough question to answer because we don't know. And I think what you have to always assume is there could be a lot of things that happen in the next three months. And particularly with what we heard from the Fed this week with the somewhat hawkish tone, leaving the door open for rate hikes and rate cuts and whatever other things they might want to do in the next six to 12 months, we're left to follow the trends. And so trends can change quite a bit. So any idea you put out there the next day, things could totally change. So I would encourage you, any sort of idea that you throw around, Think about risk versus reward and recognize where you would be stopped out of any idea. A chart I'll highlight, though, I mean, if I had to answer that question, it would probably be MUSA, Murphy USA. I was interviewed uh, yesterday by the, uh, the guys over at um, uh, Investors Business Daily at IBD for their Investing with IBD podcast. And Justin and Arusha do a fantastic job talking to some top investors, and then me yesterday, where we uh, had a great discussion about market psychology and technical indicators and, you know, different ways to think about price patterns, and also just focusing on market conditions and what we were seeing. And I highlighted this because it is one of the great examples recently of what's called a cup with handle, or what I call a cup and handle pattern. That's a classic pattern that William O'Neill popularized uh, and in his books, how to make money in stocks and elsewhere. He talks about this particular pattern. It's really a basing pattern. After you've had a run, you have this rounded sort of consolidation pattern, right? Sort of have this big rounded pattern. It looks a lot like a cup. And then you have this shallower pullback, which is the handle. And then if you look, the key, uh, one of the key parts of this uh, pattern is that the rim of the cup and the handle all should ideally be about equal, right? The idea is you hit a level of resistance, then you have this basing pattern kind of building up momentum. And then when you finally break out of that range, ideally on heavier volume, that indicates an influx of new buyers and implies much further upside to be had. So I'd be inclined to look at a chart like this. Number one, that is going up, not down, at a time when a lot of charts are uh, in correction mode. Number two, a tried and true pattern that has tended to work in all different environments. Uh, and number three, just keeping in mind that things can change. And so with this sort of chart, sort of a good idea here, but then where would you exit it, right? What would you use as a trailing stop? Would you look at the 50-day or 10-week moving average or some other sort of, uh, sort of approach? So that's how I'd answer the question. I'm curious how you guys would answer that question. And if you didn't answer our poll, Drop a comment on our video today and uh, let me know which ticker you would pick to answer that poll question and uh, why. I'd be fascinated to uh, hear. Let's continue on with our market recap. Look at how things played out. A lot of red when you look at 
the uh, major averages today. The S&P finishing the day down 1.6%. This is one of the worst days we've seen in quite some time here, certainly since the August peak, uh, and, and, and again, which overall has been, I think, a period of distribution. You're seeing a little bit more of it today. S&P finishing around 43.30, so pushing below that 4,400 level. Now, all of a sudden, we're looking at 4,300 as the uh, next sort of big round number uh, below current levels. The NASDAQ composite even further, down 1.8%. As we mentioned in the uh, in the introduction, mid caps and small caps all down as well. Small caps actually outperformed, but the uh, small cap S and P 600 still down one and a half percent today. So pretty much a, a day of red for most uh, for most uh, major market indexes we would track. The only green you see on the first page is the VIX, which gained over two points today. So yesterday on the show, we're talking about the VIX just above 15. The implication of volatility increasing and how when markets tend to sell off when they enter a corrective period. You often have a spike in volatility because investors get nervous. They start to, uh, you know, they're, they're fearful of further downside and the drop, initial drop in stocks fuels additional selling that causes volatility to spike and sort of feedbacks, uh, feeds back on itself. And that's what often causes the VIX to spike pretty quickly during a uh, pullback phase. The VIX today up a full two points plus from yesterday, now around 1730. We're going to look at a chart of the VIX here in a little bit and look at what today's move uh, does. We're not quite to uh, the level it was uh, recently after the initial drop off the August high, but we're right about at that level uh, at this point. Now, part of the story today, interest rates pushing higher, right? Yesterday, we sort of debriefed on the, uh, on the Fed meeting. It was sort of real time, right? I'm, I'm watching the press conference with uh, Jay Powell sort of digesting what we're seeing, looking at the reaction to the markets. We went live with the show at 4 p.m. Today is maybe, maybe another day to process what's happened. And I think what's happened a lot of times on Fed meetings up until this week is you often get that bounce. And certainly you did uh, for, for the last year or two. You have this nice bounce on a Fed day, and then it would be sort of back to normal. And after that initial reaction, the market would kind of settle in. And I thought about that yesterday as we rolled down into the close, wondering if we would get a continued follow through today, or if you'd see some buyers coming in and thinking, all right, things are not that bad. You really didn't get that, right? Today, you see rates pushing higher. You see bond prices moving lower, stock prices moving lower, uh, all suggesting a little bit more of a risk off. And again, I would say the conditions that we're seeing now, there are things that are breaking down significant levels, but a lot more are breaking down short-term support levels, right? They're just not going up anymore, and they're starting to pull back to where you need to think about further downside projections. But medium to long term trends arguably still very much uh, in play. Now, higher rates, unfortunately, are not good for growth stocks. So when the 10-year yield is threatening 4.5%, which it is, when the long bond yield is above 455, uh, which it is, and the five-year point uh, just above 4.6%, these are relatively high numbers compared to recent history. As a reminder, rates can and certainly have gone much higher than 4.5%. We may look back in years to come and uh, reflect on how great it was when interest rates were down at this point. I hope not, because that's going to make everything a lot more expensive, particularly if you're buying a car or a house or anything like that. But for now, higher rates certainly weighing on growth stocks, and that's what we're seeing today. Interestingly, the dollar, not a huge change from yesterday's close, kind of similar with the, uh, on the UUP. Gold and silver, very different days. Gold, uh, the GLD was down 0.7%. Silver actually pushed higher by about a half a percent. The broad commodity ETF DBC was down about a third of a percent. And crude oil prices up slightly. Energy kind of in the middle of the pack, but moving lower along with most other uh, equity sectors today. All red on the cryptocurrencies. We have 10 of the most liquid coins that we track here with Bitcoin and Ethereum both down 2% today. That puts Bitcoin below 26,600 and Ether uh, now below uh, 1,600. That happened uh, since yesterday when we were recording the show. So a bit of distribution here. Again, most of these are bouncing off of key support levels not too long ago but now stalling out in their attempt to retest previous highs from earlier in 2023. Now, the S&P sectors, all 11 in the red, and you can see the best performing sector, healthcare, was still down almost 1% today. That's not a great uh, feel for the, uh, for the markets today. The XLV, as I mentioned, uh, in first place. After that, utilities, which spent some of the day at the top of the list, down 1.1%, followed by communication services and staples, both down about 1.2%, 1.3%. The big losers today, real estate down 3.5%. Consumer discretionary, the XLY down 2.8%. Amazon, which is a huge weight there, uh, moving lower uh, um, along with a lot of the other FANG stocks. And then materials, the XLB was down 0.2, uh, excuse me, 2% as well. Let's go to a daily chart of the S&P 500. Things are really starting to get interesting on the chart of the S&P, and I'll tell you why. 
Uh, one of the things we've talked about on the show has been this potential head and shoulders topping pattern. And the reason why I label it a potential head and shoulders pattern is because it's not a valid head and shoulders pattern until you break the neckline. And the neckline is the trend line that connects the interim lows. So you take the head, the left shoulder, the right shoulder, you draw a trend line connecting the, uh, the swing lows in June and August. That basically lines up to where we were at today. And unfortunately, we closed below that neckline. So I would say at this point, we now have a valid head and shoulders topping pattern. What I would say you're looking for now is follow through. So this is Thursday session. We close below. The question is going to be Friday. Do we get any sort of bounce as a reaction? A lot of things gapped lower today. A lot of things breaking down. Do you see buyers coming in, pushing prices higher into the weekend? If so, that would kind of quickly invalidate that head and shoulders pattern. It needs to have a follow through, meaning an additional move below that trend line in my experience. We go lower on Friday, and I would say that it's hard to deny that this is anything but a broad distribution pattern with a lower high. Now, here's the good news is the measurement isn't dramatically negative, right? And the way that you do a measurement when you do have a valid head and shoulders top, you can use what's called the percent change tool on stock charts. And so what you do is you take the distance. I'm going to make this a little thinner. Take the distance from the high, the peak of the head, down to uh, the neckline, right? So the trend line. Take the high, the, the head, down to that midpoint. And then what you basically do is do a similar, um, uh, whoops, take a similar move down here. And that's basically saying we've now broken below, let's say, a parallel move, the height of this pattern projected from the breakdown. That would give you a downside objective around 40, 50 to 4,100. What's interesting, that actually lines up with this congestion area here. This has been a, a shaded area on my daily S&P chart for quite some time, mainly because that was the peak in December. We then had a failed attempt to break above it. We then finally did break above it in April, and that became support. And we sat there for about a month, maybe six weeks, before finally breaking out at the end of May. It would be interesting to see if that becomes the next level of support. So for now, that's sort of the base case that I'm looking at as a measurement uh, measured move taking the height of that pattern. Assuming that's a breakdown and we get follow through on Friday, that could be the downside projective, uh, objective for the S&P. Now, what's interesting is note the other support levels we're breaking through, and that's what you have to remember, right? The trend line from the October and March lows still in play. That's currently around 43. Well, actually, it's around 42.70 as of today, but sloping higher, of course. The 200-day moving average, not too far uh, below as well, around 4,200 just below that. So other levels of support to pay attention to uh, as well. But you know, I, th I think the breakdown today for me sort of solidifies that distribution pattern. And again, I'm looking very closely tomorrow to see if you get some uh, a follow through. Is a validation that today's breakdown was not just a fluke, but maybe something uh, something further. Now, measures of breadth have certain become, certainly become less bullish, and now I would argue uh, becoming a little more bearish. If you look at the percent of stocks above their 50-day moving average, we're down below 20% as of today's close. So less than one in five S&P stocks still holding their 50-day moving average. Now, the S&P itself broke below there in August, traded back above there in late August around Labor Day, and now rotating back lower. And what's so funny is if you look at this, we're kind of getting that ABC correction we talked about a couple of weeks ago, right? What's the ideal sort of three-wave pullback phase? It's an initial wave A, a reaction wave B, and then a wave C, and that would be another way to sort of measure this three-wave pattern. Maybe time to dust off that chart if you uh, made a note of it when we reviewed it and, uh, and see what sort of downside objective you can get there. Another interesting note in terms of breadth, and again, a lot of the breadth indicators getting more negative this week. Um, now below 50% of the S&P 500 numbers remain, members remaining above their 200-day moving average. Now the S&P still, you know, 140 points or so above its own 200-day moving average. So there's a little more daylight between current levels and that potential level of support. Most S&P stocks, are, though, are already below their 200-day moving average. That's where measures of breadth can be kind of interesting, because while the benchmark is holding up, you're finding a lot of individual stocks are actually already failing to hold that long-term uh, potential level of uh, support. We mentioned the VIX, and just to talk quickly about the, um, uh, the VIX chart, uh, you know, for me, it, I, I think of volatility in terms of volatility regimes, right? Where is the VIX over time, and, and what you often find is we move to a certain range, we kind of sit there for a little while, and that defines the volatility for that period, and then something changes. And we might be on the precipice of one of those changes, uh, only because we've been around that 13, 14 level for quite some time. I shaded in green that general uh, price range for the VIX. 
Look at how much time. Most of June and July we were in that, in that area. We spiked up in August when we had that initial pullback. Then we came right back down to that range. Now we're back up to where we were at the end of the August peak. So the VIX gets above 18. The VIX starts making a, uh, a new high for, uh, for this part of the cycle. Maybe that opens the door to get to 20. And the problem with the VIX above 20 is that is usually a pretty good sign of a bearish move, right? Particularly when the VIX has been below 20 for a while, then starts to spike above there. For a lot of investors, that's sort of the back of the envelope are we in trouble or not? And as long as we, the VIX remains below 20, things just aren't getting that crazy. We get above 20, all of a sudden, I think you need to rethink what type of phase we might be in. This might be more of a protracted uh, corrective phase. And remember, markets can correct in one of two ways or both, right? Price and time. So it could be a time correction. It could be just a choppy, noisy consolidation phase. But it tells you that the gains that we experienced in the first half of 2023, at least for now, feels like a big pause button has been, uh, has been implemented for that one. Now, to finish off our market recap, let's talk about a couple of individual stocks that uh, you know, are top of mind as I'm watching uh, today play out. Amazon, of course, you have to focus on the XLY, uh, really, uh, getting, uh, really struggling today. One of the worst performing S&P sectors. Now, Amazon is a huge weight in the XLY, along with Tesla and Home Depot. The three of those are probably about 50% of the XLY, maybe a little bit more. Uh, Amazon down 4.4%, and that obviously a big drop, but... It's also gapping below the 50-day moving average. And, and again, while that's not the only trading system I think you would ever need, one of those basic general trend-following premises that I've always followed is a trend is in good shape as long as we hold the ascending 50-day moving average. Once you break that, that tells me at least you need to revisit the thesis and just think, okay, now that we've come down below the 50-day, what's the overall conditions? Where might I anticipate support if we get further downside Am I still comfortable holding this name after we've broken down through that point and, uh, and so forth? The challenge and what happens a lot of times with these gaps is what happens that next day. That's why we always talk about this concept of follow through. We've had a gap lower. We're now below the 50 day. Tomorrow, I think pretty telling, right? One of two things could certainly happen. Uh, scenario one, we find support at today's low, which lines up pretty well with this consolidation here in July and August. And maybe we start to rotate back up a little bit going into the weekend. And next week, we have a nice recovery. Option B, though, you get further distribution tomorrow. And I would argue that that is a pretty ugly chart, at least in the short term. And it's a good reminder, right? I'm often asked about Fibonacci retracements. I think this sort of environment, pretty decent time to try to implement that sort of, uh, that sort of uh, analysis. So if you take the low from January, I'm taking the high from August, just because I'm assuming that this was a retest move here to 145. And now we're trading back down 120 would be sort of that first Fibonacci support level. Maybe that's the level of anticipated support as we uh, if and when we'd continue to uh, distribute on the chart of Amazon uh, going forward. Maybe I leave you with one positive uh, chart here before we wrap the market recap. As I'm going through, I feel like the things are just getting less and less uh, rosy as I'm going through these charts. The good news is, I shared, you know, Murphy's USA earlier. I mean, there, there are charts that are working. I think that's a great reminder. In any environment, there tend to be stocks that are working. There tend to be stocks that are not. Although more in this case, I think, are, 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 are breaking, uh, you know, new swing lows than breaking new swing highs. I scanned earlier today for stocks making new three-month highs and lows and new lows outnumbered new highs by about a four and a half to one ratio. So more, more likely, if you pick a random stock, that it's going down than up in this particular moment. However, there are charts like Molina Healthcare. There's a healthcare provider. There's some biotech names uh, and others that are actually looking just fine that are breaking out. So a good reminder in this sort of environment, when it starts to feel like the names that you've been following for a while, like the Amazons are starting to rotate lower, the benchmarks are starting to rotate lower, there may be some opportunities. You just need to make sure that you have a good set of tools, a good set of routines to identify those attractive charts. That's it for our market recap. I want to bring on today's guest, Ms. Schneider. Before we do it, couple quick announcements. First off, we would love to hear from you, particularly your questions. We're going to do a mailbag segment, actually a full mailbag show tomorrow on Friday. We'd love to feature one of your questions in our mailbag show. You can email us your questions at the final bar at stockcharts.com on X. Just tag us in a comment at final bar SCTV. And of course, I hope you're watching this on our YouTube channel. Just drop a comment below this video or any of the others on our channel with any questions that you have about technical analysis, about investor psychology, market history, whatever it is, we would love to uh, hear your questions and point you in the right direction. Also, as a reminder, we do a weekly live Q&A on our YouTube channel every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. If you want to not forget the next one uh, on our YouTube channel, there's a little uh, tab that says live. If you go there, you'll see a placeholder 
for next Wednesday's live Q&A. Just click on that one and hit the notification. You, uh, will, you will be uh, notified when we go live with our next live Q&A. It's every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern right here on our YouTube channel. I want to bring on today's guest, Mish Schneider. Mish is the Chief Strategist at Market Gauge, coming to us, as always, from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Mish, a pleasure to see you. How are you guys down there? We're doing great. I mean, all things considered with what's going on in the environment in the market. But yeah, you know, that's that's the market. And then there's life. I try to keep that distinction. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. As always, I mean, Mish, who better to approach things with a good sense of, uh, of purpose and sense of calm. So I appreciate it, as always, Mish. You know, we had our Charting Forward special uh, not too long ago, which was a lot of fun. You really had a lot of value in terms of thinking about some of the bigger picture charts and how they've evolved. We have a couple of your monthly charts to kick things off, looking at retail and looking at small caps. When you are trying to make sense of the markets in a busy week, the Fed and everything else, what do these charts tell you about conditions here? I started out this year looking at these two key moving averages, the 23 month and the 80 month, because there is a thing in e in economics where you have a two year business cycle within a bigger business cycle. And I had a feeling coming from 2021 to 2023 that we might actually see some kind of a reset of that cycle or at least test the parameters of it. And so granny retail, as you know, and this is what we talked about on in the charting forward, was my biggest concern because number one, as a US centric ETF with all those big box stores in it, which have made 52 week lows in many of them, where the rest of the market got through that 23 month moving average to show some level of expansion, potential growth, this never did. So mm. that kind of told me I never really got too bullish in the market. I mean, obviously we enjoyed the first six months for other reasons with tech and, and, and the growth stocks. But in terms of the whole economic picture, when people started talking about this expansion of GDP, just look here, 70%, right? There mm. you go. So it's hard to get too excited. It's hard to get too convinced about a soft landing. And it could be the fact that XRT was not, not only not able to get through that 23 month is now threatening the green line, which is the 80 month moving average. Mm. My whole thesis was on the basis of in that two year cycle, do we get a brief period of growth or are we going to go more into a recession? And as a six to seven year business cycle, that 80 month measures that. We've seen spectacular moves below that 80 month as a major change of trend, long bonds being a perfect example. So if this mm. breaks it, we'll look for some level of confirmation like you were talking about before with the spy chart. You know, one day does not necessarily confirm, but if it stays below, then I would say recession will be on the lips of many. Yeah, it's hard to imagine we would have a great recovery from here without retail at least being a part of it in some way. And we certainly haven't seen that. Small caps, on the other hand, did break above the 23 month, but then came right back out within the range, right? Well, and that's a perfect example of a confirmation. So we got one month, right? Two months ago, it cleared it. But then last month, it did not. So we started to see some trouble and we're gonna talk about the calendar ranges momentarily, but in IWM's case, the Russell 2000, again, granddaddy of the US economy, kind of telling us that this sector was not really buying the idea of we're going into a major growth period and the economy is looking so great, more like a stagnation, right? Mm. So now we're broken down below it and so hard below it, uh, this month so far in September, one of the things we also talked about in Charting Forward, September classically, terrible month. Yeah. But but if, again, and Granny being a lead indicator in the retail sector, if IWM then starts to break down under that 80-month moving average, we're going to be in for some some tougher time. I've, I've already bookmarked these two charts. These are awesome mission and really helpful to just think about, you know, which way we break out of that range. That could be very telling for broader market conditions. Now, speaking of which, talk us through the, the chart of the SPY, the QQQ, same monthly chart, very different look than retail and, and small caps. What does this tell you about the broader conditions? 
Well, I kind of wanted to step back a little bit here uh, on a monthly basis, because like I said, I thought this year it could come into play. And so this was really what got everybody very bullish mm -hmm. was when we started to break out above the 23 month in both the NASDAQ, more so in the NASDAQ. Obviously, that was the big flight that we saw in semiconductors, the whole AI conversation. Uh, and fear that inflation, no fear, excuse me, that inflation was going to continue. And then there was even talk that people thought that the Fed would actually cut. And we certainly put an end to that conversation this week. So the fact now, what's so interesting is when you talk about some level of retracement, again, going back to XRT and IWM, if they continue to break down, this may not just be a retracement, but if they can hold or break down and then come back through, then these levels that we're looking at in both the Qs and in the spies could tell us that things aren't as bad as we think. And this was a correction more to reality. Mm. And then we can go back to sort of trading between this 4,100. I know the, the, the blue line there, the 23 month is more like 4,200. Mm -hmm. you know, we can overshoot it a little bit and we can go back to sort of that range between 4,100, 4,300, 4,400 until we have more evidence of what's happening with inflation. I think that's really the key here. Same thing with NASDAQ. We didn't yeah. quite make it up to the all-time highs as we can see, um, but certainly uh, this is definitely in better shape than the small caps, but not necessarily a great measure of the U.S. economy. Yeah, it, it's so interesting. Your, your next chart deals with some ratios, and I love this idea of thinking about, uh, you know, just sort of risk on, risk off, what sort of relative movements we're seeing. When you look at these different uh, ratios, what does that you know, sort of build on what we talked about so far in terms of risk assessment or risk uh, aversion in the markets? And, and exactly what we're doing here, Dave, is we're trying to build up a conversation so that people have a perspective and not are just looking at one day. Mm -hmm. So with, with these risk gauges, and, and this is a very important conversation because right now there have been people out there who are talking about the fact that when you get the Fed funds rate and the CPI close together, then you get some level of normalization. And so in the risk environment, you really don't want to see interest rates drop much further if the SPY also drops along with it. Because essentially what that means right now is we are in some level of risk neutral. We've been risk on since April. So all those corrections we were getting in June, and then again in early August, we were looking at those as buy opportunities because we never went risk off. And now if you're looking at the SPY versus the TLTs, with the TLTs dropping and the SPY dropping, the SPY is still outperforming. Yeah. Is it wowing anybody? No, that's why we're going risk neutral. The same thing with the one below, the junk bonds. So important to look at those junk bonds, that high yield, high debt situation they also are continuing to outperform right now the long bonds. So even if they drop, which they did obviously today along with everything else, there's a ratio that has to be watched. And the one that actually has broken down, of course, is the SPY is now underperforming the gold. Now we saw that before, if you just move your cursor a little bit to the left there, right there, we had that one blip where gold started to outperform and then it flipped right back. Yep. So this is something to keep an eye on. And the other thing, as you mentioned in the very beginning, silver actually closed in the green. So the inflation conversation comes back into play when silver starts to outperform gold. And then if gold is outperforming SPY, and we can talk about that if we have time about what kind of inflation I'm looking at now. Mm. And then finally, you have wood versus gold, which is the classic, you know, if wood is actually doing better than gold, then we're not we're not that bad off in terms of uh, everything we just talked about in the economy. Yeah, and it's interesting, particularly with like the SPY, the TLT, I think people immediately think when the market gets defensive, you want to rotate to bonds. That ratio just continues to find new ways to go higher and higher, I feel like. So no change yet in that trend, right, according to, uh, according to your chart. Now, just to finish off, Mish, I know you guys uh, at Market Gauge uh, just recently added some new uh, indicators to the Stock Charts platform, a uh, new ACP plugin, which is super exciting, uh, featuring the calendar range indicators. We're looking at uh, gold and the VIX. Can you just briefly explain these and what they're telling you about conditions here? Well, look, can we start with the VIX? Because you had talked yep. about the VIX, and it kind of fits in with everything we're talking about right here. 
So essentially, if you look at the VIX right now, that green, this is the new plugin, by the way. So what's so exciting about working with stock charts now for us is that we, if you layer together the leadership uh, plugin, the real motion and momentum plugin, and then the calendar range plugin, you really can actually start to get some ideas. So everything we just talked about is, are, is well, can retail fail further from here? Will the spy fall further, but yet find some level support a bit lower? Or are, are we really screwed and everything is just going to go to hell in the handbasket? Well, today, the VIX on that green vertical line, excuse me, green horizontal line, broke out over its six-month calendar range high. Now, it's been there before, got right to the 200-day moving average, which is another green line above it, a little confusing. And now here we are about to test that again. And you can see it's well outperforming the SPY in our leadership indicator. And look at the momentum just kind of went off the charts over the last couple of days. So when you put that all together, what you really have to say right now is if that contains, if it, that continues to have a leadership role and the momentum improves, and now that it's clearing a six month range, and then it changes phases by a couple of closes over that 200, then we can probably argue more that risk neutral will go more to risk off. Mm, interesting. And what about gold here to wrap up? Well, gold is a very interesting, look how gappy it is. I yeah. mean, that's, it's been all over the map. But two things that really strike me is one is the six month calendar range low, which is that horizontal red line. And then the six month calendar range high, which is that horizontal green line. We're kind of like sort of dancing in the middle there with gold. And we broke down under those moving averages, which actually almost seems meaningless right now because it's been up and down and up and down. To me, what's more meaningful is the two things we've already said. One is that silver is looking like it's starting to outperform again. Two is it's showing leadership over the spy. Mm -hmm. And three is that in the momentum indicator, um, we actually have a little bit, we have a negative diversion. It's been under the 50 and the 200 for a while. But if the momentum starts to improve on that and we hold those calendar ranges and we can get back over that 50, then it, it kind of tells me that um, gold is not done. It's just been choppy. And if you look at it from a relative price level, it's still been holding over that 1900, which I think considering everything that's gone on is, is pretty strong. Yeah, no, this is super helpful. And it's interesting with gold, Mish, it's so easy to just look at the choppiness, forget the fact that we're not far off of all time highs. I mean, gold, gold has been you know, pr pretty high relative to where it's been here recently. Uh, Mish, this is awesome. Thanks so much for going through all of these, uh, all these charts, particularly your new indicator. Congrats, we're super excited to have it on uh, stock charts. Best to Keith and everyone down there in Santa Fe. We'll talk to you again soon, all right? Thank you so much, Dave and team. That's Ms. Schneider. Ms. is the chief strategist at Market Gauge, coming to us from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Again, a big fan of the Market Gauge team. And some of these indicators, I think, really help to put things into context. What I love about Mish is in a week where we're talking about the Fed, I'm focusing moment to moment on how the S&P, the TLT, and other assets are doing as Powell is speaking yesterday afternoon. We invite Mish on the next day, and she's bringing monthly charts to really put things in a proper perspective. What a great dose of reality. And remember the time frame that you're trying to operate on. Don't forget about monthly longer term charts to really put today's movements and this week's movements into proper perspective. What a great take, as always, by Ms. Schneider of Market Gauge. By the way, she was part of our Charting Forward special that we just released uh, in the last couple of weeks. Make sure you check that video out if you, uh, if you miss it. Really good wide ranging discussion. And a lot of things have played out kind of how we discussed with seasonal weakness into September, which often happens and it is certainly happening right now. We got to wrap the show, folks, and go to the three in three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here is chart number one. I'm keeping it pretty simple. We've had a nice breakdown today, gap lower. So I thought I'd just take a step back, try to put what we saw today into proper context. If you do see this as a breakdown, which I think I do, um, what you have to remember is two things. Number one, how big of a breakdown? What, what I often find is people will say, okay, that was a head and shoulders top. Are we going down to 3,500? And I, I can't tell you we're not going down to 3,500. That certainly is a possibility. But based on the state of the market here, based on the range that was expressed in this head and shoulders top, only about a 6% range from uh, peak to, uh, to neckline, based on the time frame, which is only about a three to four month pattern, 
This is not a the world's ending kind of pattern. This is we're in a pullback phase with a reasonable downside objective, you know, just below 4,100. And again, there are a lot of other support and resistance levels we may want to pay attention to, but I would just think about it in a proper context. I would argue the long-term trends for stocks are still pretty positive. Stocks are still very much outperforming bonds. And while that picture can change, as I think Mitch Schneider very eloquently put out, here are the things that you would need to see to see that this is a much bigger risk-off move. We're just not seeing enough of that yet to, uh, to agree that the weight of the evidence is really more medium-term, long-term negative. It's still, you know, short-term uh, weakness, I think, is uh, clear. So remember, when you're looking at a pattern or when you're looking at the range, think about the time frame that's implied and the price ranges that are involved. In this case, if we do get a follow-through day uh, tomorrow, I would say that unlocks basically a downside objective just below 4,100 using that pattern analysis. Chart number two with the VIX, when you think about volatility, one of the warning signs we've talked about here for a couple months, right, is we've had the market moving higher and it's been on lower volatility. Back in August, we saw that the VIX was spiking. We saw that gap lower on the S&P. That, for us, told us that we might be in a, a bit of a, a corrective move. Now you're seeing that pattern reinitiated with another gap lower, names like Amazon pushing lower very, very quickly, and volatility spiking. The more that the VIX pushes above 18 pushes above 20. That is where I would start, personally would start thinking about, is this a broader decline? What sort of longer term levels do I want to pay attention to? How do I want to manage risk if the market goes down X number of points? And just have that thought process now while your losses may be minimized because we just haven't gone down too much yet on some of these leading names. Finally, really good time to revisit some breadth conditions. They certainly have not been getting more bullish. I think they've been getting less bullish, more neutral. Now you're starting to see some, uh, some more negative patterns here. We're now below 50% of S&P stocks below the 200-day moving average. That hasn't happened too often in 2023. Happened briefly in March, briefly in May. Both of those were you know, corrective moves that then resolved back to the upside. But if you look back in 2022, you can see we initially broke below 50%. Then we spent a lot of time below that 50% line. And that was one of those things that sort of confirmed that we were now in a bearish phase. I think it's a crucial time for breadth indicators like this, many of which are now rotating to more bearish ranges and bearish levels to confirm potential further downside. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. I want to thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Special thank you to Mitch Schneider of Market Gauge joining us from Santa Fe, New Mexico. For Stock Charts in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a good night.